chapter 63 babu majaa fi dhimmati llahi wa dhimmati nabiyyihi sallallahu alayhi wasallam the protection of allah's covenant and the protection of his prophet's covenant wa qawlu llahi ta'ala wa awfu bi ahdi llahi idha ahadtum wa la tanqudu al-aymana ba'da tawkidiha wa qad ja'altum allah alaykum kafila inna allah ya'lamu ma taf'alun and fulfill the covenant of allah when you have coven covenanted and break not the oaths after you have confirmed them and indeed you have appointed Allah your surety verily Allah knows what you do so uh, fulfilling the covenants and so on this is again part of the Tawheed if a person does not fulfill his covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with, with the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that of course is a deficiency in matters of the Tawheed and also the covenants with the human being as long as it's halal all that would negate the perfection of one's Tawheed uh, which shows the importance and the mandatory thing in fulfilling the covenants. When we say in Surah Al-Fatiha, Ya ka na'udu, Ya ka nasta'in, this is a covenant. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one to be worshipped. And He is the only one that we seek help from. And so on. Ya ayu aladheena aman, we who believe. And the order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so on. Burayda radiallahu anhu narrated. Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Iza ammara. أميرا على جيش أو سرية أوصاه بتقوى الله ومن معه من المسلمين خيرا فقال اغزوا بسم الله في سبيل الله قاتلوا من كفر بالله uh, to the end of the hadith I would read it in English whenever Allah's messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم deputed anyone as leader of an army or expedition he admonished him to fear Allah he said the advice of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم to fear Allah and be good to the Muslims with him he used to say, start fighting with the name of Allah, in the cause of Allah, and fight those who disbelieve in Allah. You fight and do not take unduly from the booty, nor break any treaty, nor mutilate the dead bodies, nor kill the children. When you meet your enemies who are polytheists, invite them to three alternatives. If they respond to any of these Positively accept them at their words and do not continue the war anymore. Invite them to accept Islam. If they agree to accept Islam, ask them to leave their homes and migrate to the lands of Muhajireen, the believers. Tell them that after migration they shall be entitled to get all the privileges and obligations of Muhajireen, those who migrate. If they refuse to migrate, then make it clear that they will have the status of Bedouin Muslims and shall be subjected to the commands of Allah like other Muslims, but they shall not get any share from the booty or returns of the war unless they fight on the Muslim side. If they do not confess Islam, impose jizya, uh, which is a tax of protection taken from the non-Muslim citizens in the Islamic State, on them, and if they comply with, then restrain your hands from them. But if they refuse, to pay the jizya, then seek Allah's help and fight them. When you lay siege to a fort and the besieged appeal to you for protection in the name of Allah and His Prophet, do not accord them the guarantee of Allah and His Prophet, but give them the guarantee on behalf of yourself. And this is why it's mentioned here. Give it on behalf of yourself and on behalf of your companions, for it is a lesser sin then the security provided by you and your companion is disregarded then the security granted to them in the name of Allah and his Prophet. When you besiege a fort and the besieged want you to let them out in accordance with Allah's command, do not let them come out in accordance with his command, but do so at your own command. For you do not know whether or not you'll be able to carry out Allah's uh, behest with regard to them reported by Imam Muslim. So uh, this is the order of the Prophet ﷺ to the believers when they would go fight in the cause of Allah. But the point here mentioned in, the, in this hadith is the issue of the covenant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is the covenant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that to be warned not to refer any mistakes to Allah and His Messenger ﷺ. Because mistakes are valid to occur. People can ca cause mistakes in such battles and so on. So to make their actions, it is the actions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
That means it might refer any deficiencies to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger. وسلم, it is your actions. They fulfill the orders of Allah, yes, but people can make mistakes while they're performing the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the point of the hadith uh, which is mentioned here. The protection of Allah's covenant and the protection of His Prophet's covenant that people should do the best they can when it comes to the covenant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fulfilling the orders of Allah and submit themselves and take the means of that. And at the same time, that the human being is bound to make mistakes. To, so the mistake is from the human being, not from the deen of Allah, not from the way of the messenger of Allah. It's from the shortcomings of the human beings. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are free from all these uh, shortcomings that people might fall in. And it should not refer to the deen. That's why we, uh, we also learn from that, deen of Islam is perfect. And when a Muslim falls into some ignorance, this is the fault of the Muslim. The deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from all deficiencies and from all dhulm and transgression and evenness. This has nothing to do with the deen of Allah and the enemies of Allah, those who would refer these uh, uh, deficiencies to the deen of Allah, they are wrong. The deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect and calling to what is good and forbidding what is evil. And many benefits, of course, was mentioned here. But again, this is with regarding to the tawheed the perfections of one tawheed and it shows the beauty of the deen actually these statements shows the justice and the purity of the deen of Allah that it's not based on personal benefits or national interests or whatever there is it's based on the oneness of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala